Okay, everyone, let's get started tonight. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Pierce, and I'm the director of the Transnational Literature Series at Brooklyn Booksmith, just outside of Boston, Massachusetts, and your host for tonight's conversation. The Transnational Series focuses on stories of migration, the intersection of politics and literature, and works in translation. I just want to offer a quick Zoom webinar tutorial. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a few icons. One of those is a Q&A icon where you can enter in your questions at any time during the conversation. Another button will get you to the chat window. That space is there for you all. Please feel free to chat during the event. I will be in the chat as well, dropping in useful information, including links to books by our authors. We do make every effort to keep these events free to attend in the hopes that you'll purchase the, purchase the featured books from us. So thank you in advance for taking a look and supporting independent bookstores. And finally, you can see us, but we can't see you. So relax and please enjoy the conversation. Tonight, I have the great honor of introducing Susan Cohen, Gosman Kaflani, and Ronnie Miller here to discuss and celebrate the release of Susan's new book, Journeys from There to Here, Stories of Immigrant Trials, Triumphs, and Contributions. Susan Cohen is a nationally and internationally recognized immigration lawyer based here in Boston. She is the founding chair of Minces Immigration Practice and president of the board of the Political Asylum Immigration Representation Project. Long active in the American Immigration Lawyers Association and the American Bar Association, Susan often plays an instrumental role in shaping federal and state regulations. In 2020, she led a Mintz team that represented hundreds of thousands of foreign students in litigation, which overturned a controversial and dangerous COVID-related student visa policy. And in 2017, she helped lead a Mintz team that worked with the ACLU of Massachusetts and others to obtain a temporary restraining order on the 2017 travel ban. Through her important work, she has helped many immigrants obtain asylum and has won awards from the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, the Rion Immigrant Center, and many others. Kazi Kaplani is an Albanian-born author, journalist, and scholar. He is the author of two collections of poetry in Albanian and four published novels, three written in Greek and one in Albanian. His work centers on themes of migration, borders, totalitarianism, and how Balkan history has shaped public and private narratives and memories. His first novel, A Short Border Handbook, has been translated and published into 10 languages. Since 2012, he has been living in the US, where he was a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study at Harvard University and writer in residence at Brown University and Wellesley College. He now lives and teaches in Chicago. And tonight's moderator, Ronnie Miller, is the executive director of the Rion Immigrant Center. Formerly known as the Irish International Immigrant Center, Rion was founded in 1989 and has become Boston's welcome center for immigrants and refugees from around the globe, providing education, advocacy, legal, and welcoming services. He is an immigrant from Belfast, Northern Ireland, and a graduate of UMass Boston's College of Public and Community Services. He is also the vice president of the Coalition of Irish Immigration Centers, and in 2020 helped co-found the Massachusetts Immigrant Collaborative, a diverse group of 15 immigrants serving organizations across the Commonwealth. I'm so thrilled to have them here together in conversation. Now, Susan, Ghazi, and Ronnie. Well, um, good evening, everyone. Um, so delighted to be with you. Um, I first uh, want to thank the Brookline Booksmith, uh, Pierce, Lisa, and all the great staff at the bookstore for hosting us this evening. The bookstore is really a beautiful sanctuary for so many of us. And in Celtic spirituality, there's this concept of thin places. And these are places where we can catch a glimpse of the transcendent and the distance between heaven and earth is very thin. And for me, since the first time that I arrived and emigrated to the United States, the Booksmith has been one of those places for me in New England. And I'm very grateful for the Stores Transnational Literature Series and how that, that has been such a, a rich resource for the community. So thank you for having us this evening. Susan, congratulations to you and Stephen Taylor on the publication. I really loved your writing and the way in which you have shared these stories with such hum humanity and humility. You struck the balance of introducing us to these amazing, courageous immigrants while also educating the reader on the complexities of our convoluted and sometimes cruel immigration system and processes. 
So well done. The sharing of stories is a pathway to forming deep connections and it helps us to truly, truly see and to know each other on a deeper level. And we don't take enough time to get to know our immigrant neighbors. And some see those of us who are immigrants as a threat and not as a gift. And what you've done, Susan, through these 11 stories is model the possibility that human connections can be formed and open up when we hear and share our stories with each other. With this book, you have edged us towards creating community where all are welcomed and valued. So thank you. It is a beautiful, beautiful book. It's really an honor this evening to spend time with Susan and with Gazi. I first met Susan through our shared work in immigration in 2012, and she was the recipient of our center Solus Award. And I met Gazi a few years ago when he came and visited our center. And um, I, one of my colleagues is from Albania, Georgie. And I remember telling Georgie that Gazi was coming to the center to visit and his eyes lit up and he was so, so elated. He said, he is very, very famous, Ronnie, you know. We, um, so it really is an honor, Gazi, to be with you here this evening to hear your story and, um, uh, and to get to know you better, your, your story of, of, of migration. So Susan, before we get into the book, I think I just would like to hear, just maybe understand from you, what led you into the vocation of being an immigration attorney? Okay. Thank you, Ronnie, for your introduction, your words. And it's such a great pleasure and honor for me to speak with, with Ghazi and Ronnie uh, tonight. And um, I want to reiterate our thanks to Brookline Booksmith for this wonderful transnational literature series. So, you know, I also just want to say I'm so glad that all of you out there are joining us tonight. It makes us so very happy um, that you're here with us. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we know everyone has some Zoom fatigue these days. So choosing to join us means a lot to all of us. Uh, it's great to be with all of you. Uh, you know, I didn't plan to become an immigration lawyer, Ronnie. I, uh, you know, I uh, went to law school thinking that I was going to be this, this litigator, like a female version of uh, Perry Mason, who was this figure on TV when I was growing up, you know, rushing into court and saving the day for all these different people. And I joined Mintz as a first year associate, thinking that's what I wanted to do. And they, um, at big firms, you rotate into different departments. And I was rotated into the corporate law department and just so happened my first year as a lawyer, a random immigration case came into our office which was unusual because we didn't have an immigration practice at that time, but it happened to be a Japanese potter from, uh, from uh, a tradition of pottery that he was the seventh generation in his family carrying out this exquisite art. And he was an artist in residence at Harvard here with his family on a temporary work visa that didn't let them stay. And he had decided they liked it so much they wanted to stay. So they hired our firm I got to work on that case as a very first year junior lawyer. And it was just such a wonderful thing to be able to work on because I got to work with him and his family. I got to explore his art and understand the jigsaw puzzle of immigration. I saw this person had this talent, but did the immigration law provide a pathway for someone like him? And I researched it and it turned out that it did. And I put a very large filing together, I think I went way overboard because I didn't want to lose. That's a characteristic of mine. I don't like to lose. <laughs> I want to help my clients succeed. So it was my very first case and it worked. It, it got approved and we had a big celebration with his family and they were so overjoyed and it was so meaningful. The work was so meaningful to connect on a personal level with someone in a way um, and regarding an issue that was so pivotal to their lives, you know, the giving them a place, uh, a sense of place and, and a sense of stability and an anchor that they could put down in the United States. And they've lived here ever since. And we went out for a big celebration dinner when the green card came through. That was the first immigration case I did. And then I went back to doing the litigation work. And it, 
didn't resonate with me in the same way that the immigration work had, that connection, that personal connection, being the conduit to help someone achieve their dream. Um, so I decided I wanted to try to focus on immigration law and that's what I did. I pivoted to immigration law and it's you know one of the best things I've ever done in my life to get to meet people like Ghazi and all my other clients and, and help them um, is, has been extremely meaningful work in my life. Very good. So, um, so in addition to being this sort of nationally known immigration lawyer, I know that you're also a musician and a songwriter, and I'm really interested to know what led you to write this book and, um, you know, and maybe you could share um, a reading from, uh, from, uh, from, from the book also. So I, uh, this, this book was born um, out of the, the depths of uh, despair during the Trump era when um, times were very tough for immigrants and people who defend immigrants. And I was horrified by the anti-immigrant rhetoric that was taking hold across the country and the the way that that administration was painting all immigrants with a very broad brush. And I felt that I needed to do something to try to counter those false stereotypes, which were so rampant and, and harmful and dangerous in the country in so many different ways. And I thought the best way to do that was to try to let the public see the wonderful aspects, characteristics of immigrants that I know in a very intimate way. So I could read a little bit from, from the introduction. I'll read uh, folks some excerpts from the introduction and then we'll move on. Okay, we're ready. On a cold New England Saturday night in late January, 2017, the day after then President Donald Trump issued an executive order banning immigration from seven Muslim majority nations. I wanted nothing more than a short reprieve from my hectic immigration law practice. I'd look forward all week long to attending my close friend's 60th birthday party and seeing her have fun. I also wanted to let loose myself on the dance floor. But at the party, I was distracted. I couldn't fully enjoy celebrating with my friends and my husband. I had to keep checking my phone for any urgent incoming news. I'd previously warned the host that I might have to leave early and abruptly, but when the DJ played the first song, I was able to unwind, kick off my shoes, and move to the music. By the time the second song started, partygoers had flooded the dance floor. You could feel the electricity of celebration. Like everyone else, it seemed I lost myself in revelry. But when that song ended, I realized I'd better check my phone, and sure enough, I had a message. Come immediately to the airport. Without a moment's hesitation, I said hasty goodbyes and dashed out of there, knowing that good people were being detained at Boston's Logan Airport and in desperate need of legal representation to fight for their rights. My partner, Sue Finnegan, and I, along with several other colleagues at our law firm, Mince Levin, knew that people from some of those seven nations had boarded flights to Boston. Several of them were lawful permanent residents. That means green card holders including professors at, U at the University of Massachusetts. They were unaware of this executive order signed late the night before and they were at risk. They could be turned away because of that unjustified xenophobic directive from the White House. They needed our protection. So our team along with a tightly organized small band of other lawyers, civil rights lawyers, as you mentioned, um, Ronnie, received word that a request for an emergency judge that we had made had been honored and the judge would preside over the matter at federal court sometime that night. This is a Saturday night, right? Yeah. So I scrambled to put on my shoes, rushed out, heading at rushed out from the party, headed for Logan Airport. But first I made a quick stop at my house on the way to the airport. I zipped into the driveway, left the car running with the door open, ran into the house, changed out of my high heels and into a pair of sensible shoes, grabbed a blazer to cover up the sexy low cut party dress I was wearing and didn't want to go into court and stand before the judge wearing an inappropriate outfit. So I threw the, dress, the, jacket, the jacket over my dress and sprinted to the car and rushed to the airport. 
En route, I received a call from my colleague who was leaving the airport and said everyone was meeting at the courthouse. I changed course, drove to the courthouse, parked illegally, and ran inside. I was sure my car would get towed away during that long night, but, but it wasn't. I spotted it right where I parked it as I walked out of the courthouse at two o'clock in the morning in exhilaration because we'd secured a temporary restraining order and joining the enforcement of the, of the travel ban. While the multi-step process to enter, work, and live in the United States was arduous before President Trump's tenure, it became much more difficult after he assumed office with door after door slammed shut. The administration systematically ripped apart immigration protections almost on a daily basis. Fewer and fewer people qualified for the immigration statuses and benefits to which they should be entitled. And it's not easy to reverse all of these and many other drastic changes made by that administration, despite the change in the administration that we have now. The reduction in immigration unravels the very fabric of the nation, a nation that's stronger when immigrants are able to contribute and weaker when they're unnecessarily locked out. At a policy level, it's very important to understand that individual actions by government agencies at the behest of an administ a particular administration can kneecap immigration and reduce diversity across the country from coast to coast and border to border. I've long believed in the power of introducing someone to a person from a different country and culture to change perceptions. He or she is meeting a human being and not a stereotype. And that makes all the difference. I've held these thoughts for many years, but since the Trump presidency, with its hateful words and deeds about immigrants, my feelings grew even stronger about this. Many people spew hateful lies and unsubstantiated generalizations about immigrants, like for example, that they're takers and not givers. Yet many of these same people have never met an immigrant or else they have and they didn't realize it. Consequently, they never got to know them. So this book serves as my attempt in a small way through storytelling to create human connections between the reader and some of the immigrants and their families who I've been fortunate to have represented. I also hope it helps people recognize how vitally important immigration is to our nation. Well, that, that is just brilliant. That's really amazing, Susan, too. Um, well, the first thing I wanna say is thank you and the others that night for being first responders to the airport and again, beautifully written way in which we were that right there with you as you raced to the airport and stopped at home. But also to thank you for, and all of the immigration attorneys who over the last four or five years have really persevered and, 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 and fought for the protections of immigrants and refugees. It has been absolutely exhausting um, to, to, to navigate through all of those complexities and all of those cruel systems true experts uh, that are also truly caring um, and fully committed um, to, um, to immigrants. Uh, so thank, thank you, you and the whole community really uh, appreciate thank it. Thank you. So tell uh, us a wee bit, so, sorry Susan. It's, they, the immigration lawyers did have a lot of PTSD during those four years. So be kind and nice to immigration lawyers folks. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Now, Susan, tell us about the book and how it's formatted and just a wee bit of the structure of sort of how it's mm, Very briefly, because we want to hear from Ghazi so much. I can't wait. Yeah. Um, uh, it, so I chose 11 different client stories for the book, and it's a variety of men and women from different countries throughout the world. Um, several of them were asylum seekers, and many others got their status through different routes, like extraordinary ability or that their work was in the national interest of the United States or through a family relationship. And one of the people in the book, she was fortunate to, for, she was fortunate that we have this Violence Against Women Act. She was able to finally, finally get her green card um, on the basis of that law because her husband was a, uh, a very frightening individual who turned on her and tried to kill her. And, that law saved her. So there are a lot of different stories and I try to show people all the different ways that people immigrate, many different ways that people can immigrate and lots of different ways 
but their cases can go sideways and the and 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 to have the reader as you said walk with each of them through this entire journey get to know them in a really intimate way and experience the immigration journey that way that's great and as i said earlier you really struck that balance between introducing us to these 11 immigrants but also in the in the framework of the, of the legal pathways so Gazi, um Thank you for being with us here this evening. You have had to really, you've been really forced to undergo two very separate and traumatic migration events. And I guess I would like to first maybe just ask you about your experience in Albania. And in particular in the book, you talk about coming to the border and those five minutes of meeting those border control, those officers. Tell us about what got you there that day to the border and tell us a bit about your story of getting to, to the border. Yeah, um, thank you very much. It's, uh, it's really a, a, an honor and an immense pleasure to be here and uh, celebrate Susan's book and, and meet you, Ronnie. And I'm also honored uh, that the host is uh, the Brookline Booksmith. Um, I had lived in Boston for six years. That's where we met. And uh, a few years ago, I had a reading at the same series, at the same bookstore, uh, pre-pandemic, -pan uh, um, um, of my novel, the first novel that is about borders, that is about borders. So in my, in, 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 in Susan's book, I uh, describe a real story that is my encounter, my first encounter with borders. I had many, many encounters with borders because I have been, a, a migrant for for most of my life, actually. Uh, so, and when when that scene of border crossing, of first border crossing, pays a, a visit to, to to my dreams or to my uh, nightmares, um, a, a, a sentence from a, a very famous Spanish historian comes to my mind that says, "You can." understand better the world if you view it from the border. And, uh, and, and now that I teach literature and history to American students where I speak a lot about borders, uh, I make an introduction in, in the first meeting and I explain to them how borders for me are not just an abstract and theoretical topic with which I, I got passionate at some point in my life that are based on my immediate experience. Um, I tell them, for example, that the whole history of the 20th century in Europe can be told as an history of borders and wars and refugees and migration. So the borders I speak about first are the borders of the Cold War, where my birthplace, Albania, was uh, the most isolated place in Eastern Europe. Three generations of Albanians lived in a tiny country where they could not even approach the borders. And uh, these closed borders were the symbol of violent and oppressive regimes. We call them Stalinist regimes, which had a, a morbid fixture with borders never seen in human history. And for my generation, and this is an experience actually that I share with um, many Eastern Europeans who lived on the Eastern side of the Berlin Wall, uh, crossing the borders became an obsession and became a, 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 a dream toward freedom. So imagine yourself being 20 years old and you encounter for the first time the borders in your life and the borders of your own country and three soldiers are pointing their guns to you. Uh, encountering the borders at gunpoint, and you don't know if they'll shoot you or not. And these are two different worlds facing each other on the border. On the one side, people like me who wanted to cross the border that had been sealed like a, like a sarcophagus for 45 years. And on the other, these young soldiers uh, that represent the regime with angry faces uh, that are ready to 
to kill you and to keep still the borders and the country isolated. That shapes forever, not only your memory, but your life and your moral and your political values. So you can understand <laughs> that when I listen people yelling or shouting, build that wall, uh, I, I don't have only nightmares, but literally uh, I sense that something really serious, full of fear and res resentment and paranoia is going on. Uh, so I talk about these unprecedented in human history borders, which left deep scars in the psyche of people like me and in the psyche of the whole continent, actually, in the 20th century. And the other kind of borders I talk about are those that you face once you cross those borders, like the Berlin Wall, and you become a migrant and a refugee. Susan said that she didn't plan to become an immigration lawyer. I didn't plan to become a migrant either. <laughs> uh, but once I became a migrant, I understood that migrants and refugees are surrounded by borders, both visible and invisible. Symbolic as border, symbolical borders, legal borders, think about papers. Sometimes it's very difficult to convey the experience of a migrant, what papers mean for a migrant, how they define the life of a migrant, how a travel ban can define the lives of generations, not only of one person. So being a migrant myself, I've, I've tried to convey the experience of migration as, as an experience that is both very old and very new, as, as a very personal experience, because everyone, as you have seen also in the stories that uh, Susan so beautifully told, has a different itinerary, but also there are some universal experiences that we share uh, with each other. So. Um, these are the two kinds of borders that I talk uh, about because they both have shaped my life. And also um, uh, the characters of my novels are, are people who have been uh, defined by these two kinds of borders. Very good, thank you. <clears throat> so, so as a young 20 year old, you approached the, the border and you faced those three border control officers and the standoff happened for those five minutes. And it was incredible, just again, felt like as if we were there in some ways with you as you were standing. So when you crossed over then into Greece then, tell us about sort of what you, you know, what, what, you, what your career was. Tell us a wee bit about your life in Greece, what you did, and then sort of what led you then to leave Greece. Oh, that's a very long story. <laughs> that's a very long story. Just briefly. <laughs> of 20 something years. I mean, um, as I said, I didn't plan to, to become a migrant, but actually I didn't plan to stay even in Greece in order to give people to understand that plans of, of our lives as migrants are like the plans of everybody of us. They might be accidental, they might be sometimes by mistake, they might be by choice and everything else. So, um, but in, in Greece, I became a migrant from, you know, from someone fleeing, as many Eastern Europeans became migrants fleeing, like crossing the Berlin Wall. And uh, uh, I could say that one of the features that characterized us was, um, uh, was a thirst from, for freedom and uh, a huge naivete, because when you are isolated, you, 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 you don't know what you will encounter. You, you have built a distorted image of, of the world beyond the border. So uh, we personally, I had a huge curiosity to make that country that I chose that will be mine. The same curiosity that I had for for the United States when I, when I came to America. And actually the first place, and I tell it to my students who very few of them have visited and I'm a little bit surprised. 
that the first place that I visited when I came to the United States was Ellis Island. Uh, I, I wanted to know uh, the history of, of migration, especially because I teach Eastern European migration to the United States and, and at a certain, at a major extent is a migration that shaped uh, this country. So uh, I did many things and among those many things where um, uh, that I became a writer and a known journalist writing about migration. Uh, I gained a faithful audience and I tell this story also for people to understand all this um, very distorted discourse about the successful migrants and the non-successful mi migrants and so on and so forth because I was a a successful migrant. But because I was a successful migrant, uh, I became also the target of, um, of hostility from people who don't want migrants or minorities to be on an equal foot, who see them as a danger, who don't want their voice to be heard, their narratives to be heard. So, uh, and we arrived at a, at a point that even my physical integrity became very problematic. So uh, I, I was in real danger, actually. I was harassed for almost 10 years, 10 years, uh, because of my activity as, as an author and journalist. <laughs> Nothing more. Uh, and, uh, and at that point, uh, that's another choice that is very tough. When you have built your whole life in a place, you have contributed so much to the culture of country, um, and you see no other solution than, uh, than to leave it in order to, 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 to save your dignity and, 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 and even to save your life from, from threats. So that's why I actually it was, again, a kind of coincidence because I came to Harvard invited as a fellow, as, as a writer for my, because my books, which I wrote in Greek, <laughs> became um, international bestsellers. So, I was invited by Radcliffe Institute um, as a writer in residence at Harvard. And that's where, um, that's the moment when also the, the neo-Nazi groups in Greece were uh, becoming very violent and they entered the uh, parliament. We are talking about criminals. They were uh, outloaded um, last year, fortunately, um, because they are, a replica of 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 uh, the of the Nazi. We call them neo-Nazi, but they are real Nazi. So killing people and beating people and stabbing people in the street. So I was in their uh, block list, let's say. So I decided to not go back to Greece in that moment. Also, because after living twenty years in a country. I was, I, I, I never got citizenship. So you can understand what does it mean because we talk sometimes, you know, we tell stories of migrants um, in, in terms of uh, uh, struggle, but behind the struggles, there are, there are real problems that a migrant has to, struggle with the sense of dignity. What does it mean to be in a country 20 years and, and be denied the citizenship? After contributing also so much to the culture of the country. So, and, and you have to make a choice. And this is a choice, also a political choice, a personal choice, and a, cho a moral choice. And, uh, at that moment that I didn't know what to do because I was thinking to, uh, to migrate to, to another country where my books are also um, uh, all published in, in France and I have a, a, a very good network of friends. Uh, 
I, I had a job offer from Emerson College and, uh, and I met Susan. <laughs> I met Susan and uh, I, this were really, we, when we talked with Susan, these were really very, very difficult years. You, I, I can't describe here what the consequences in my personal life were that I had to leave the country and to come here. I didn't come here to, to do career. It was a moral choice, a, a choice of dignity. I didn't come here to make money. So, uh, and, uh, and we talked and, um, and that changed the course of my life, meeting, meeting Susan. And um, it's also, it's sometimes it's very difficult to, uh, um, for people, uh, as, as Susan said, she made the best choice of my life um, and, uh, and and fortunately, also for me, that she made that choice. <laughs> I became a lawyer, but, but the role that the uh, uh, lawyers of migration play in the lives of people like me is uh, of um, of an importance and the significance that is it is it is very difficult to to, to even to describe. is is immense is enormous. Well, well, the, I've really, you know, to really sort of captured that being fleeing from Albania and then being forced uh, for your life. It sounds like it was a matter of life and death that you needed to leave Greece and to come to the United States. So in the book, you use a, a beautiful phrase, Gazi, migrants of the world, you said, you know, we talk about citizens of the world, but you use this really lovely phrase, migrants of the world. And I'm wondering if you can comment a wee bit about um, sort of the insecurity if you're not a citizen. You said you were not a citizen in Greece, and but also that feeling of insecurity here in the United States. Was there a sense of insecurity while you were here, even in the United States? Like, how did that feel when you weren't a citizen, but you were? Was there a sense of insecurity that you know when you when you become eventually become a citizen that is secure? What, what was that like? Not being even a citizen here in the U.S. Uh, Ronnie, it's um, it's really it it takes years to elaborate. Um, what does it mean to to start from scratch in a new country? It's an experience that I I I, I don't wish to many. And to start from scratch when we are in, in the mid forties, uh, um, in a country that you know no one. Uh, so it takes um, it takes a lot of energy, and it takes. But um, even now that I'm 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 a, I'm a citizen, uh, and uh, I have also this discussion many times with my readers and with my students. I said that I say that I'm a migrant of the world in the sense that it's, I have been a migrant. It has shaped my life being a migrant. Uh, I have not traveled in this world like by, only by choice, though migration is at a certain extent also a choice, even a moral choice or uh, a life choice. Uh, but also I sense this, um, especially during the the, 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 the the Trump years, I sense this moral obligation that I have to emphasize uh, that I am a migrant of the world because migrants were being harshly stigmatized. And it is fascinating, surprising, and shocking to me. And it was that, and it is that this was happening in the United States, a country that was shaped by migration. So I, I felt also a moral and political obligation to emphasize in a moment where the word migrant became a pejorative word to emphasize that I am a migrant uh, of the world and I am a migrant and I will always be a migrant no matter if I carry the U.S. passport in, in my pocket. Brendan, um, 
I, 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 as an immigrant, as a migrant myself, it really resonates with me. And, and even just that feeling of being exiled also. Um, uh, you, you mentioned in the book about that you like being on the side. There was a phrase you used that you, in your story with Susan, that you like being on the side of the losers <laughs> and that you were suspicious of winners. And I wondered, has that changed for you and now in 2022? Like, are you still suspicious of the winners or what did you mean by that, right? You said that yeah. um, you like being on the side of the losers yeah. and were suspicious of winners. Yeah, thank you. Uh, now, I, I, I said this a little bit as, as a writer that is very interesting in, in history and history is very complex. It cannot be read as a binary juxtaposition of winners and, and, and losers. It's very worrying if we read the history that way. Um, I think that the, our previous president read the history that way. Uh, and it's very, it's very warring and it's very violent. Um, but as a writer, also as a person, I, I am someone who was born with, with, with my back against the wall. I, I, in Albania, I was born in a um, family that was persecuted very harshly from the regime. So especially in places, I come from places, Eastern Europe and the Balkans, where history have been, has been very tumultuous and many times has been very violent. And uh, in, in a violent history, many voices are lost. And so it, I don't believe that literature has a mission, but if literature has a, has a mission is to recuperate these voices, to bring them from, um, from the nowhere place to, to, to the center, to be heard. Because these voices will never be heard, will, you will never read them in the history textbooks. But these were a huge part of history, these voices that were lost. And I think that a writer always, and you know, as, as writers, uh, we don't find winners very interesting. I, I think that losers are, are much more interesting characters than, than what we call losers, than, um, than winners. Uh, that's the, at least that's my perception of literature. Interesting, so interesting. And um, I, um, you know, you, you, I said earlier how that migrants sometimes are viewed as threats and not as a gift. And Gazi, you are such a gift to the United States and to, 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 um, uh, to our society. Um, Okay. Susan, back to you just a wee bit, because um, the story, the book is full of these 11 stories, Gazis and 10 others, and I'm wondering if you could just very briefly introduce us to Rana, and we tell us a wee bit about her story, just in terms of her contribution to the United States, you know, tell us a wee right. bit about, introduce yeah. us to Rana, please. Right, immigrants contribute to the United States in such a variety of important ways. And I placed Ghazi's story first in the book because he speaks for all migrants, so the migrant psyche, you know, and it's such a, such a gift, like you said, uh, that, that we have him here. And so Rana is another client whose story is in the book. And she's a very interesting woman who came from Egypt and she grew up in that patriarchal society she uh, became uh, very in interested in computer science at a young age and she ended up doing quite well. And she uh, actually got married in Egypt to an Egyptian man, but in, in, in uh, something very unusual in, in a way that was quite unusual, she sort of bucked the, the tradition of staying with one's husband because she wanted to do a PhD in computer science and she got accepted to Cambridge University in, in England. And she actually went to England and did a PhD in computer science and um, carried on a long distance marriage with her husband, which is very, it was very, very unusual thing to do uh, for a Muslim woman coming from that, that world. And then she ended up coming to MIT where I met her. She came to do a postdoc at MIT and I have the privilege of, uh, 
holding office hours regularly at MIT where I get to meet a lot of foreign entrepreneurs who are looking to stay and do different things here. And she heard about me somehow or other and, and got my name and, and gave me a call when she was still a postdoc doing her PhD. And she told me what she was working on and asked if I might be able to help her stay. What she was working on at that time was fascinating. She uh, is a she's an expert in, in artificial intelligence and how to use and um, build AI applications that bring uh, human emotion and intelligence into our devices to make us, to, to help with bonding in our common humanity and helping our devices actually be a source of, of a bond between people and not an obstacle or, or a delta or distance between people. At the time she could create it she, with, with another woman, scientist, a, a um, wristband wearable medical device that they invented that actually was for autistic kids and adults. And uh, people with autism can't um, perceive the emotion in someone's face when they're in a conversation with another person. They don't know what kind of emotion the person is trying because they don't read the cues and it's difficult for them. So this device it was an amazing thing. It actually, kids would wear it and be based on the technology, it actually helped them navigate the world. They could actually read the emotions in people's faces and actually help them interact. I was blown away when she told me what she was working on and she asked if I might be able to help her. So I did, I got her a visa uh, and eventually a green card. She ended up founding the, a company based on this invention. And uh, she's, a, a leader in AI emoting com computing, and she's become quite world renowned. Actually, she leads a company at, uh, in Boston that was just acquired by a big multinational company, and she's a dynamo. Um, and she is, created a lot of jobs in Boston at her company. And a lot of the people that they've hired also have come. She spons the company sponsors people on work visas. Some some of them come from other countries, um, all from all over the world, and are computer scientists and things like that. And they're working. They're working on all the new applications for the technology that she's invented. And now she has you know hundreds of people working for her, and you know she does TED talks and and is featured in in the New Yorker and and things things like that. Uh, but she's just a, she's, she's a gift um, and she's created so much opportunity and so many other people like her. I talk about some of them in the, in the, po in the uh, epilogue of the book, some of the other people I've worked with from the, you know, in, in inventing world from, you know, some of the universities who are making things better for the rest of us, creating, creating products and opportunities, building the jobs and, and, and really growing our economy. But you know, everyone in the book is contributing in, in, a, in an important way, on the, whether it's on the front lines of COVID as a nurse practitioner um, or you know, working in, in some other industry like Jose Salgado. He's an amazing educator. Um, he's, his story is featured in the book. He's from Honduras. He has transformed multicultural education in this country and he did it little by little. And he had a very long odyssey. And many of the people in, whose stories I tell in the book um, they, all, they did everything right from the beginning, but the system let them down um, in, in many cases. And they were taken advantage of either by lawyers who were not uh, paying enough attention or doing a good enough job, or unfortunately by the government. And I wanted people to read the stories partly to see all the ways in which our government errors and the ways that can really create tremendous difficulty for people. And get them to the verge of deportation through no fault of their own people who all of whom entered the country legally in the first place and had a right to the benefit that they applied for. Um, there's a lot of complexity to immigration. There's a lot of ways that things can go sideways or wrong. So to Ghazi's point, you know, having a good immigration lawyer can really make, make the difference to someone's ability to, to actually secure that dream, you know, because um, it can go either way very easily. Okay. So thank you. So we have a couple of questions from our guests and I invite anyone that has a question to, to put it into the, into the question box. Um, 
So you know, from Dorothy Jones, uh, the question is really, you know, these are remarkable people and all success stories they, they, they got in. And Dorothy's asking, you know, shall we infer therefore that the system is working? Can we infer that the system is working because these really talented, courageous people got in? No. <laughs> in a word, no. System uh, is extremely flawed and needs a lot of reform. And there's um, thousands of changes that have to be reversed from the prior administration. And uh, the system works sometimes, but not nearly well enough. So, you know, there are some stories in the book and you can hear stories from your friends and other people you know that are very sad stories where the system is letting people down um, even when they have the right, they have the legal right to what they've applied for. So we need a lot, we need to do a lot of work on our immigration system. Very good. And on, building on that then, another guest, Greg, has asked us, do you foresee that the opportunistic nativism of Trump dissipating as our political moment changes, or do you see it, or do you anticipate it continuing and growing, especially with the likely refugee crisis in the years ahead? So do you see, what, what I guess the question is like, how do you see this shaping up in the next two or three years in terms of immigration reform and pathways to citizenship? It's fraught, it's, it's, it's not so clear cut. I think that uh, the, the nativist sentiments always lurking out there, you know, even though we now have President Biden who's pro-immigrant in general. Um, the, the world is, is, and in Gaza, you can comment on this. I mean, the, the world outside of the United States as well is, is seeing a, a, a lot of unfortunate um, use of migrants as political weapons in Europe and other places and uh, in here too at the border. Um, and even with respect to Afghans, you know, in terms of the most recent Operation Allies Welcome, that was really a mixed situation. We, you know, we have a lot of um, people who are still opposed to large scale immigration um, and it's a political issue, it's a political you know, hot potato and the, both sides of the aisle do not see eye to eye. You know, one side views it as an enforcement through an enforcement lens and the other side views it as a, you know, an opportunity and we should be a land of opportunity and welcome immigrants. Um, and, and they're really uh, at loggerheads, you know, so it's, it's, it's not an easy topic. And I, I do worry, I, I'd like Ghazi to comment as well, because, you know, you, it, xenophobia rises and falls over a course of history, we're in a you know a better time now in the United States, but I still worry. Ngazi, could you comment too? Um, yes, thank you, thank you, Susan. Um, now I, I teach the history of migration, especially from the 18th century onwards until now, uh, especially from Eastern Europe and from Europe uh, to other continents. Uh, so, um, migration ha has never had a, a, a rosy history, it has been a process with, um, with conflicts, contradictions, um, rise of, uh, of nativism, rise and fall of nativism, if we talk about the United States, but because I, I know better the United States and Europe in terms of migration, I see that now we are um, at an, um, I would say at an inflection uh, point. I mean, uh, the way that minorities and how Europeans behave to the minorities in the 20th century, how the world behaved to the minorities in the 20th century uh, shaped the 20th century. I think that the way that we will face um, uh, migration and refugees will, will shape this century, we, will shape the values of, uh, of our societies. And, uh, um, you know, from a political point of view, uh, after World War II, after the Holocaust, after so many refugees, especially in Europe, uh, the new world that was built 
uh, the new moral world that was built globally through the United Nations was that uh, refugees and migrants will be taken care, will be welcomed. There will be rules, there will be humanitarian uh, uh, framework to behave to uh, refugees and migrants. Now, I see in the last 20 years, and it, it, it reached a peak in the United States, that all this framework is started to be unraveled, especially from the Western countries, Europeans and the United States. And um, I, though I am a, a refugee and a migrant myself, I, I don't have I don't have easy answers to this, but uh, what I can do as a writer and as a teacher and what I do with my students, I, I try to go back and to, uh, and to understand the history of migration, that this is not happening now. Migration is an integral part of human experience on earth. People have migrated, Will my, are migrating and will migrate forever. And the second thing that I, 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 I can do is to share personal stories of these migrants. Because saying that, oh, 20,000 um, migrants came to the border is a statistical thing. Describing the life of one of those 20,000 is very important to understand what is behind this. Why do they want to leave? How? And I think that that's one of the virtues of Susan's book uh, that uh, brings personal stories of people. You can't understand a migrant and you can understand anyone without hearing uh, his her story first. And that's what Susan does. But uh, I think that we are, as I said, fear, resentment, and I'm afraid a lot of paranoia is, is knocking on our doors. Very good. Um, we have, we've been given an extra few minutes here to continue. So we'll, you know, we'll take maybe just one or two more questions and we, we, we can, we'll wrap up in, in a few minutes. Um, but we have been asked the question: like, what can what can our guests do? What can what can the community do to support this work of supporting immigrants and refugees, and even immigration reform? Susan, what would how would you respond to that? Well, I, I would say that um, for those who uh, are in this community in the New England, one way that you can really make a difference is to consider volunteering or donating either to Ronnie's organization, the Rian Center, or to PAIR, the political asylum organization. The um, website is in the chat because the work that they do it helps so many people. Um, and uh, there are a lot of other wonderful nonprofit organizations in the country that help immigrants. And, and supporting them is important because having an immigration lawyer provided by one of these, these nonprofit organizations um, where someone could not otherwise maybe afford a lawyer makes all the difference that people who are represented are five times more likely, for example, to win an asylum case than they are if they try to do the case on their own. And, um, you know, there are a lot of people can't afford an immigration lawyer, but nonprofit organizations like PAIR, Rian Center, provide lower cost services or, or either lower cost or, or pro bono services uh, make a big difference. And on my website, I have a website, www.susanjcohen.com. I have a resources tab and I have a list of all, I think about a hundred organizations across the United States and internationally that do excellent work that people could look at in your own community to see if you could find one in your own community to, to, to donate or volunteer your time to. I think I would, um, I would add to that, Susan, just in terms of on the legislative piece, right? Obviously we, we yearn for comprehensive immigration reform, 
but even locally here in Massachusetts, I think, you know, neighbors and we all can get behind pro-immigrant legislation. There's legislation right now at the legislator that uh, will support immigrants that are here and that around, say, for example, the driver's license, which is the a driving family forward bill that's presently in the transportation committee very soon in the next month or so if we hope that, that will move out of transportation committee so i would encourage all our guests to be writing if you're based in massachusetts to be supporting local even at the state level or at the city level to be supporting add your voice call your legislators and support the driver's license bill the safe communities act which is really important yes. around, uh, preventing deportations and so forth so um, I would I would encourage you on the on the national level, Susan. Is there anything you would say that we yeah. could do to, around immigration reform? <laughs> There's so much that's needed, but one very concrete thing that if people would write to their Congress people about would be to ask Congress to introduce the Afghan Adjustment Act, which President Biden asked Congress to do, but Congress has not done yet. All the people we brought over from Afghanistan are here on a very temporary status called. Um, parole, humanitarian parole. And that doesn't let them stay permanently. And, and a lot of them are going to need to file for asylum, but it's been very difficult for many of them to win because they had to flee without any documents. So if we can get this law passed, it will be uh, almost automatic way for all those Afghans who came to be able to stay permanently. Afghan Adjustment Act is what we need. Brilliant. Thanks, Susan. Well, listen, I think as we wrap up here, um, I would like to just give Gazi maybe just one more opportunity just in sort of in wrapping up and in closing the night, I want to say thank you to Gazi, of course, for being our guest here this evening. Is there anything that you would like to say just in terms of for, to, to our guests about sort of, you know, and any encouragement, anything that you want to, you would like to say just in, as, we, as we wrap up here? I, I want, first of all, to express my gratitude to, to you and to Susan and to the bookstore and to all the people who we are here tonight. I think that the that I didn't discuss um, uh, very much the also the practical side of supporting those who support migrants uh, is, is, is so crucial and, and it really uh, change changes the the, the lives of, of of people and sometimes of generations of people. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Gazi. Uh, keep up the really good work, and we we uh, we love you, and we uh, we we're with you all the way. Susan, is there anything in closing that you would like to say? Just to, it's been an honor to be here with you both with the book, the book line Booksmith and, and with all of our guests tonight. And I, um, I really, really appreciate um, having this conversation with everyone. Uh, it's been an honor for me and I wish everyone all the best and, and stay safe out there in the snow if you're in New England. <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, Susan. Congratulations to you and Stephen. We're really, um, congratulate you, and uh, I encourage Thank everyone you. to. I really encourage everyone to 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 buy the book and to read it. You will you will you will want to read it. You will not want to set it down. You will you will want to read it all the way through. So thank you, Iris. I'm going to hand it over to you. Oh, thanks, thank everyone. You. Thank you all so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us, um, Susan and Gazi. I know you're busy, but I, I hope you are catching some of the wonderful messages in the chat. This is yes. really um, right. yeah. such an immense appreciation of your work and and um, it's really lovely to see some it's a it's a joy to do this work it's not always easy um, but it is a, a joy to be in in a companionship with people like you doing such incredible work and um, wonderful thank you all we do have the book if you'd like it signed I put the link in the chat Mm -hmm. um, you can just go back into the page where you registered and get another ticket and get the book signed. Um, we also have Ghazi's book. I put that link in the chat. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been a joy. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye, everyone. Good night, everyone. Take bye -bye. care. Good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.